What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for System Shock, specifically the remake, of course, of the 1994 classic that went on to inspire the likes of Bioshock, Prey, and many immersive sims in general. Before we get into all that, a few things I do have to mention at the beginning here. For starters, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. Linked below in the description description is a video covering everything that I go over, and my Steam profile is public and linked below as well. That said, this game does have some buggy achievements that are worth mentioning. For me in particular, I couldn't get the achievement for completing the game on the highest difficulty settings because the achievement just wouldn't pop. While I did the activity, the achievement does not seem to be unlocking correctly, Though it's worth mentioning, I was using some save files from a review build, which might be why I was able to get some that other people weren't able to get. But right here at the beginning, I do want to mention that there are a handful of buggy achievements, too, I was unable to get myself. So hopefully, when those get fixed, I can use the save files I have now to just hop in and grab them real quick, but something to bear in mind. In the case of System Shock, a few other things I have to tell you are that previously I had done a sponsored video for the launch of this game, and while the review of the game would never be sponsored, it is of course important that I let you know that I did do a sponsored video for this game previously. And with that came a bit of early access to the title ahead of its launch, which meant I had actually put about 20 hours into this game before the game had even released. Least. However, with this early copy that I received, the achievements were not active, which means the times are going to be a little weird here if you happen to go check out my Steam profile for this one. Because having already played through the game, I had a bunch of save files ready, etc., so it was pretty easy to go round up the achievements in case you are curious. Now last but not least before we actually dive into this thing, I like to avoid spoilers for people as much as possible, and in the case of System Shock's remake, that is a difficult thing to do, because realistically, many people are going to be playing this for the very first time, in addition to people coming back to check out the remake specifically. And that is a bit of a fine line to walk in terms of making a video, because in my honest opinion, the best experience you can have with System Shock is going in blind and experiencing a lot of this stuff for yourself. And basically almost everything I go over or discuss here because of the game's nature as an immersive sim can be a little bit of a spoiler. But on the other hand, the game is also technically 30 years old, so it just kind of is what it is. But point blank, if you want the best experience of this game, the short and sweet answer is I liked it very much, I would encourage you to experience it for yourself, and I do think it's worth $40. The original System Shock from back in 1994 was considered a breakthrough in gaming in general. It went on to inspire so many different titles, specifically the immersive sim genre, but even just beyond those things, it had a cultural impact, you could say. The main villain, Shodan, which I am 100% just going to pronounce as Shodan throughout this thing, represents a lot of what people find intimidating and are afraid of about AI as it advances, and this villain represented a very early version of that, though the fear has remained largely the same since. And because of this, and how this villain was presented throughout the game, a lot of that has persisted even outside of the game itself, which I think is remarkable. However, what I think is especially interesting about the remake itself is how faithful it stayed to the original game. And while I fully admit I have not played the original, what I did do was use basically all of the guides for the original game just to see if they held up against the new one, and almost entirely they do. Outside of a few things that have been changed here and there to flow a little better in the remake, such as the exact positioning of something you might have to pick up, like a security clearance card or exactly where an item is, things like that, the guides for the original game are still very much so relevant for this remake, which I thought was especially cool. But from there, I want to talk a little bit about the technical state of the game, which is something I always like to touch upon for new releases as well as much older titles just so you kind of get an idea for how they are running and for the most part I would say System Shock runs very well. I didn't really encounter too many problems outside the occasional frame dip which was pretty rare. That said I'm running this on a very high-end machine that I use for work and because of that and the fact that we're after the release date I did some research into how this was running for other people and it seems to be pretty good across the board and given the sort of retro modern look they were going for that's not a huge surprise we're not exactly on the edge of graphical fidelity here 
But on top of that, I didn't really run into too many bugs either. I would say probably the most notable thing that is very common is that the physics on dead enemies can get a little crazy with bodies sort of jittering and moving around. And if anything actually interacts with those bodies, sometimes they can go flying, which is not a thing that happens while they are alive. But dead enemies can go a little ragdoll to the extreme which was usually more humorous than a problem. And on top of just that, the game also has a variety of options that you like to see in a game like this with a field of view slider for those who have trouble with things like motion sickness caused by that or the ability to change the color of a lot of the UI. There's like four or five different options there with the standard one being green. But if you have trouble seeing that, you can switch the entire UI colors to something else, which is why mine doesn't quite look like everyone else's if you happen to watch a lot of videos on this. So needless to say, it looks like on the technical side of things, they did a very good job here. It's running very well, not really having any substantial problems, which is certainly what we want to see. But from there, let's talk about the difficulty of the game. Now, as this is a game technically from 1994, something to understand about the difficulty is that this is not a game that's going to hold your hand a ton. Not a lot of stuff is tutorialized. However, we can adjust the difficulty via a few different options. The actual combat difficulty, the complexity of the puzzles, the mission itself on top of the cyberspace missions. Combat is what you would expect. It's how many enemies you are running into and how difficult they are to deal with. The mission is a little different. Shodan is going to be following us throughout the level, which we'll talk more about soon. But basically, mission difficulty is how involved in that process she is, with the max difficulty only giving you five hours to complete the game. Puzzle difficulty just affects the complexity of some of the logic puzzles that you will be given throughout the game. You can actually bypass these entirely with an item if you have it. So even at their max setting, it's possible to just walk completely around these if you have that item. So this is not a huge deal either way. And then last but not least, we have cyberspace. We'll talk a bit about cyberspace later, but there are portions of the game where we will enter cyberspace to do some hacking and this determines the difficulty of that, with the highest meaning that if you die in the game, you die in real life. Talking, of course, about cyberspace and the actual game, not the game and IRL, unless, of course, Shodan downloaded herself to your computer, in which case you've got other problems. But next up, I want to talk a little bit about the story of System Shock. So this is an interesting one. I'm not going to be going full spoilers here, but it's more or less what you'd expect in terms of how it ends. Now, to start, we play as a name nameless hacker. There is no character creation or anything. We just play the character that we play. Our character was trying to hack into a company known as Trioptimum to find information about an implant. We are caught while we were doing this and brought to a citadel station in orbit around Jupiter, which is a research station where the man in charge here, Edward Diego, asks us to hack into the station's AI and remove its ethical constraints. And if you do this for him, he'll actually give you the implant you were working for, which is what happens. You remove these constraints and then you are sent to medical to get the implant given to you before being put into a healing coma. However, when we wake up from said coma with our implant, we notice immediately things are very different. We awaken to find a station that is mostly filled with mutants and cyborgs before quickly discovering that the unrestrained AI has simply gone rogue, started killing everything everyone and considers itself a god and plans on wiping out the human species. Needless to say, we'd like to stop that from happening. Shortly after we come to, we're contacted by someone from Earth who manages to get through to us finally, where they explain what is going on and that they need someone to put a stop to the mining laser on Citadel Station before it can be used to hit Earth. However, that's not all of the story. This does, however, put us in a sort of head-to-head -head with the station's AI, or Shodan. And while that's as much as I want to tell you about how this advances specifically, there are a few other notes I wanted to talk about. For starters, how you advance in the game can be very, very vague. And this is part of being a very, again, faithful remake. But the first sort of leg of the story, the first mission, if you will, is way too vague on what you need to do. The subsequent missions after that initial leg become much more clear. What you're trying to achieve is relatively straightforward. There's a lot of evidence pointing you towards what you need to do, and even if you have to figure out how, you know what you're supposed to be doing. In the beginning of the game, they really struggle with that, 
to where in my initial playthrough, I was like seven hours into the game just exploring and running around until I suddenly realized I had no idea how to accomplish the thing I was told to try to do. And I wound up looking up an old guide for System Shock because I just had no idea what I was even supposed to be doing. And that's a bad problem to have right at the beginning of the game, in my opinion. And if there was one part of this remake where they could have given you a little more direction, I really think that was it. Beyond that, though, the story is really, really good. I think the dialogue and Shoden as a character is just incredibly well done. There's gameplay mechanics which involve her sort of constantly watching you through things like cameras and screens. And the way she talks and sends enemy units after you is just incredibly sinister. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the gameplay section, but as a villain, she is just incredibly well written. And because of that, I think the story section of the game holds up even today, especially because of what the villain represents in terms of a very realistic fear around the rise of AI, which is something the world is currently contending with. Not obviously in this context yet, but it's becoming more prevalent. Now that does finally bring us to our progression systems. Progression in this game is, for the most part, straightforward, but it's implemented in an interesting way. So for starters, we have our weapons. We start out with nothing. We eventually find a lead pipe, but across the game, we'll come across a variety of weapons, both energy and regular old ballistic. That is to say, bullets, as well as our energy, which is a resource we can spend to fire certain weapons or use particular abilities. Weapons themselves are not all made equal. Some are stronger, some are weaker. Many of them have different ammo types that will do different things. You're going to be picking up a lot of weapons, but they can all be changed a little bit farther by finding mod stations. Mod stations will allow you to spend credits to buy a mod, which will then affect a weapon in some way, either more damage, more ammo capacity, things like that, just making it more useful overall. This also extends to other items you can use in combat, such as various types of grenades or combat boosters, such as an item that will give you more health or more damage in some way, which typically comes with a drawback after a certain amount of time. But then probably the most interesting thing we have is the hardware. The game's heads-up display, as well as many of your functions in the game, are dictated by the hardware modules you can find. There are eight of them in total, and they are more basic things, like simply your map, two more complicated things like a suit that will protect you from radiation and biohazards at the expense of energy or boots that will help you run faster or jump and sort of jetpack your way up to things, again consuming energy alongside a few other helpful things, but all of these can be activated or deactivated, which will actually turn them on or off for your heads-up display, which I thought was a really cool idea that helps you immerse yourself in the game more. Now, each of these hardware units comes in a couple of versions, versions one through three, basically the basic thing, and then the upgraded version that will do more stuff for you. Some of those are, I would say, mission critical, like you're going to need them to advance, but many of them, when activated, such as the biohazard suit or the boot, can actively drain your energy if they're turned on, so turning them on and off in certain areas can be a big part of combat as well. Because as I mentioned, we need some of that energy for some weapons. But that does bring us to the combat and stealth mechanics. So, combat and stealth in this game are relatively straightforward, but still very interesting. Now, honestly, if you've ever played an FPS or an immersive sim before, you kind of know what to expect, because a lot of those games got their ideas from this game. We have our standard melee weapons, we have our various types of regular weapons, our energy weapons, our throwables such as grenades, which all give us a variety of options to deal with enemies. We can also use stealth to sort of get around certain enemies or position ourselves better, but stealth is mostly about avoidance and not directly taking on enemies. You're not going to deal any extra damage from stealth, etc., but it can be useful to sort of scout out a situation before you walk blindly into it. All of this can be further enhanced by the boosters you can find laying around, which again give you all sorts of combat benefits, but then usually a drawback of some kind after a while. And while all of that's basic and what you see on screen is pretty much all there is to it, there are a few things I wanted to mention here. If you die, this may or may not be a game over depending on the situation. Scattered throughout each of the Citadel's 10 levels, you can find restoration bays. Shodan has co-opted these to turn humans into cyborgs and the like. However, if you can find them and turn them off, you can restore them to their original purpose, which is making sure everyone is healthy. So if you are on a floor where you've restored these, typically you'll just respawn 
at that point. Now, on the highest difficulty of the game, if you die and that's not active, that's it. It's just game over. And you don't get to try again, whereas on regular difficulties, you can just reload a save and keep going, so it's not a huge deal. But I did notice this is inconsistent. Sometimes, if you have activated a prior restoration bay and you're on a different floor, it will actually send you back to that other one. And then other times, if you get killed by, say, a boss or something, that's a game over. So it's a little inconsistent in its deployment of that mechanic, but for the most part, that's how it works. But another thing I want to talk about is enemy respawns and the like. As you play through the game, you'll be trying to stop Shodan's influence throughout the station by culling her cameras as well as her CPU nodes, and this will contribute to an individual level's security meter. And once you've brought this down to zero, for the most part, things will slow way down. Enemies won't really respawn or anything anymore. But prior to that, it's possible for Shodan to send new enemies on the level, and you'll have to deal with things like respawns and just more enemies in general, depending on the setting you have, which is one of many reasons it's important to lower the security level, because sometimes things can just randomly pop out at you because they respawned. And I will say this led to several jump scares where I turned around and I was so immersed in what I was doing that I wasn't expecting an enemy to be there, and I jumped out of my seat probably three or four times. Because pretty much every enemy in this game has this sort of unsettling quality to them. So in terms of combat, I would say it's probably not going to blow you away in terms of mechanics. I think the industry in general, in terms of both the feel and everything, has kind of moved on since then, but the remake definitely spent most of its time here, and it does feel pretty good. But I wouldn't say it's anything to really write home about. That does, however, bring us to the world and gameplay section. Now, the thing I want to talk about here the most is the atmosphere of Citadel Station. We are on a station orbiting above Saturn that is devoid of non-hostile life. Everything's a mutant or a cyborg that is actively trying to kill you, there's an AI telling you what terrible things are going to happen to you, and while that can sound corny on its face, they absolutely nailed this. This game oozes atmosphere. There are parts of it that are just incredibly cramped. There are other parts that are fairly open. There's weird science experiments. There's things that look futuristic and inhuman at the same time. And it's all presented in a way that, while obviously a video game, lends itself to believability which really helps with the immersive part of it being an immersive sim. Because when you're hearing the villain talk or just listening to logs and messages that you find throughout the station, you kind of get a sense for what happened while you were in a coma. And all that stuff just pulled together to just really immerse me in the game. And as I stated just a minute ago, I was so immersed that I got jump scared multiple times because I was so focused in on the experience that enemies caught me off guard and genuinely scared me a couple times. But luckily, we can put a stop to some of that by taking out Shodan's cameras as well as her CPU nodes, which is also part of the story technically, as a required objective which will prevent some of that respawning from happening as well as advance the plot potentially which will make your life a bit easier. However, one thing I haven't talked about up to this point is the inventory. It is very, very restrictive. You have pretty limited inventory space. It can be upgraded twice to give you a little bit more, but once you start picking up a lot of your guns and things, you're gonna need a place to store this, and you do have access to a cargo elevator on each level, but the inventory space here is very, very small. So while it's not a big deal in the beginning of the game, towards the later game, I did find myself doing a lot of sort of inventory Jenga, that meant if I wanted to have a lot of weapons and the ammo required to use them, I just couldn't really carry anything else. And that's a problem because the primary method of getting credits is recycling. Basically, every non-critical item, that is to say something you should be using, can be vaporized into scrap. The scrap can be given to a recycler that you can find on various levels in exchange for credits. You can spend the credits on mod kit stations or vendor stations that will then provide you more materials like various boosters or health items, more ammo potentially, and just various things. So I did find managing my inventory to be a struggle towards the late game because it's like I need credits, which means I need to pick stuff up, but I don't have any room to pick things up because I have all these weapons and things I need to use to kill the enemies, which get pretty beefy towards the later game. And I found that to be a sort of difficult process overall. On top of that, certain areas have hazards, as I mentioned in the progression portion. We will get a suit that is going to help us get around these hazards, which involves turning a protection off and on. But this does not solve the problem in its entirety, as you will still take a little bit of damage, but, you know, much more slowly. 
So that's something to keep in mind as you walk through. And this is to say nothing of the various puzzles we're going to run across. Occasionally, in order to reestablish a connection or open a door, we're going to have to solve some logic puzzles. These are pretty basic. There's a couple different types, usually seeing you trying to connect power from one point to another or fill a power meter to a certain point as well. And depending on your difficulty, these can be easy or complex. For the most part, I found them fine. They weren't really obtrusive or anything. But the thing is, you interact with these while time is not stopping at all. So you need to make sure no one's around you because enemies can and will potentially sneak up on you while you're trying to do these. However, you can find an item that when plugged into the puzzle will just completely bypass it altogether and save you some time. Which I thought was nice. Last but not least for the world section of the game, we have Cyberspace. Our character, being a hacker, sometimes necessitates the hacking of various things, and we do this by going through cyberspace and interacting with a sort of mini-game here that sees us unlocking various doors and things around the station by taking out cyber cores in the cyberspace. Now, this is done through what is essentially a shooting mini-game where we just kind of fire off our hacking projectiles at various little programs designed to keep us out. Now, as we play through more and more of cyberspace, you can find various pickups that will give you new abilities to counteract some of what the enemy protocols are doing. For instance, some of them will shield up in a form of ice and you can get a drill power which will cut through that. You also get things like a damage multiplier or a movement ability, but what's probably really interesting about this to me is that it feels like the part of this that you're controlling is almost swimming. You have a ton of control over the exact direction you're looking, with the ability to move in basically every direction and orient the camera however you please as you try to make your way to the cyber core while dodging all sorts of things designed to keep you out. On the hardest difficulty, dying here will actually kill you, so you have to be careful and make sure you're picking up the health pickups, but for the most part, this was not really that bad. I'd say it's a pretty cool concept that you only have to do in short bursts. You don't spend a lot of time here by any means, but occasionally some things like doors, etc. will have to be opened by participating in this minigame. All of that, though, does bring us to our Steam Deck section, and I'm happy to say that this game runs very well on the Steam Deck. No real problems here. I think the retro modern look they were going for helped out a lot. I think the controls largely lend themselves to a controller, and while enemies do have specific points at which they'll take more damage, like headshots, etc., which means a mouse and keyboard is preferred for precise aiming, it's still a fine experience on the Steam Deck, and again, it's relatively easy to run, which was nice to see. Now, one thing I do want to mention is that the game only has partial controller support, which means you might want to reconfigure a few different keys on the Steam Deck, but for the most part, I didn't really see this as being a problem personally. But probably the biggest thing to keep in mind for the Steam Deck that I hope gets fixed pretty quickly is that while the game is supposed to have cloud saves, which should cause them to sync between your PC and the Steam Deck, that doesn't appear to be working correctly right now, so unfortunately, you can't carry forward those playthroughs. That's probably the biggest drawback right this second, but otherwise the game's running pretty well there. Though I have seen some reports of people struggling to get it to run on the Steam Deck for whatever reason, but this doesn't appear to be widespread, though something to keep in mind for sure. That does, though, bring us to our positives and negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. Now, on the positive side of things, the atmosphere of this game is incredible. I think they nailed that. I was genuinely very immersed while playing this game, and I think that's the part that really sells this as a whole package, which is helped in no small part thanks to the villain herself, Shodan who it genuinely feels like is watching you throughout the experience, reacting to you, and doing everything in her power to stop you, which can give you some really creepy vibes while you're playing the game. Which brings me to my last positive, which is that this is an incredibly faithful remake. I would say it takes the things that were great about the original, which is very old, and manages to update them for a modern audience while keeping the essence of what the original is, to the point that all of the old guides and things for the original are still relevant. You can still use them, which is exactly the type of thing you want from a remake. They really managed to keep the identity of that original game, which is really surprising to me, to be honest. But that brings us to the negatives. As I mentioned, the first part of the game is incredibly vague. I had no idea what I was trying to do even. And I wound up just having to look it up because after like seven hours, I was like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. And I think for a remake, they could have probably done a little better job of pointing you in the right direction at the start of the game. 
But much of the game is about exploration, so this isn't really a huge deal per se, but I think it is an issue some people are likely to run into. But the other part of the negatives was mostly the inventory management and the buying stuff with credits, which requires me to vaporize things, but I might not have enough space to do that because I need to carry all my weapons around. The storage space they do give you is very small, which means what I wound up doing was simply just storing all my items on one particular level, because trying to carry everything around just felt like a hassle and I got tired of dealing with it. That said, we finally have our conclusion. Ultimately, I would say System Shock is a fantastic remake of a classic game, which makes this game equally enjoyable. It's a wonderful experience, and while it, I think, does get a little meandering in a few points, by and large, I think it's a great experience if you've ever been curious about the original and a game that inspired tons of other large franchises and games. This is a great way to check it out. Because outside of some minor issues, I think they knocked it out of the park. Which means for a $40 asking price, I think that's very reasonable. I think for that money, you'll be able to check out this title with mechanics that are not nearly as clunky as the originals being almost 30 years old. So with that said, I think System Shock is both worth your time and your 40 bucks. That, though, is all I've got for you guys today. I certainly hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.